Good morning, everyone. My name is Brenton Brown, Chief of Staff for the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's outreach webinar that is held in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. On today, we have representatives from the USDA's Farm Service Agency, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Risk Management Agency. And these representatives will speak about financial and technical assistance that is available to minority farmers in South Carolina. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ms. Ann English from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, who will offer some opening, opening comments. Good morning, and thank you, Bren. On behalf of USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, a Farm Service Agency and Risk Management, and of course, in partnership with the South Carolina Commission of Minority Affairs, uh, we welcome you all to this virtual information meeting. We're excited that y'all have joined us because this is kind of a different way that we're doing business than we normally do. And th this is something that uh, because of COVID, you know, we have adjusted and we have adapted to ensure that we can still provide people with information that will help them be able to protect and also preserve their natural resources. Uh, I'm not going to speak too long, but I do, would like to say this. Um, USDA as a whole, our, our, our mission, our goal is to ensure that we're able to get you the necessary information that you need in order to participate in any of our programs if you so choose to. One of the things that I like to say is, you know, it's about helping people help the land. But now I'm about to say it's about meeting people where they are. And right now we're doing it virtually. Hopefully in the future, we will be able to get out, come out and meet and greet you on your land or wherever that could be. So with that, Brent, I'm turning back to you. Once again, thank you, Ms. English, for, for those wonderful words, and we appreciate your presence. Um, just to let everyone know that today's webinar will be recorded, and you will be provided a link at the following, at the conclusion of the session. Uh, furthermore, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat box function, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will also have a Q&A session um, at the end of the, each of the presentations. Uh, next, if you need to speak, you can use the raise your hand feature and the moderator uh, will acknowledge you by sending a request for you to unmute your phone or unmute your computer. And finally, if you are joining in by phone, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. Without further ado, we will begin our, this morning's presentation with a presentation from the Farm Service Agency and Ms. Sabrina Bryant, who is the State Outreach Coordinator. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for that introduction. Um, as he said, I am Sabrina Bryant. I'm the State Outreach Coordinator for Farm Service Agency here in South Carolina. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my presentation. Next slide. So the Farm Service Agency is a part of USDA and it serves all farmers and agricultural partners through the delivery of effective and efficient ag programs. Um, FSA provides farmers with a strong safety net through the administration of commodity programs and also helps to conserve the na nation's natural resources through CRP, which is the Conservation Reserve Program. We also provide financial credit to producers who are unable to receive private commercial credit with a special emphasis on beginning minority and women farmers. Next slide. So I'm going to begin by just giving a brief um, description of our safety net programs. I'm going to start with um, ARC PLC, as it's known, the Agricultural Risk Coverage and Price Loss Coverage Program. Um, ARC PLC provides payments to farmers when the actual revenue for a covered commodity falls below the expected revenue. Next, we have WIP, Wildlife and Hurricane Indemnity Program Plus. Um, WIP Plus helps producers affected by natural disasters in 2018 and 2019 who suffered losses to crops, trees, bushes, and vines. We have NAP, 
which is our non-insured crop disaster assistance program. And that provides financial assistance to producers of non-insurable crops. When low yields, loss of inventory, or prevention occur to natural disasters. Next, we have LIP, which is our livestock indemnity program. LIP pays livestock producers for livestock death, excess of normal mortality or injury caused by an adverse weather event or attacks by animals reintroduced into the wild by the federal government. Next slide. Next we have ELAP, which is our emergency for livestock, honeybees, and farm-raised fish. ELAP pays producers for losses due to disease, adverse weather events, conditions, including blizzards and wildfires, as determined by the Secretary of Agriculture. We have TAP, which is our tree assistance program. TAP provides financial assistance to eligible orchids and nursery tree growers to replace or rehabilitate eligible trees, bushes, and vines that are also lost to natural disasters, such as hurricanes or wildfires. Um, next, we have MPP Dairy, which is our margin protection program. This is a voluntary risk management program for dairy producers that offers protection when the difference between the all milk price and the average feed costs fall below a certain dollar amount, which is selected by the producer. Next slide. For our foresters, we have Emergency Forest Re Restoration Program, EFRP, is a cost share program that provides emergency funding and technical assistance to owners of non-industrial private forest land. This program provides assistance to carry out emergency measures to restore forest health and forest resources on land that has been damaged by natural disasters. To be eligible, you must have existing tree cover or had it immediately before the natural disaster occurred and it must be owned by a non-industrial private individual, group, association, corporation, or another private entity. Next. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our farm loan programs. As I stated earlier, we do provide um, credit to, to, to borrowers who cannot receive commercial credit from a commercial institution. So I'm gonna start with our direct operating loans. These are used to purchase items such as livestock and feed, seed, farm equipment, fuel. Um, it also pays for family living expenses and to make minor improvements to buildings and fencing on your farm. Um, this has a $300,000 loan limit with a maximum seven year term. A direct farm ownership loans can also be used to purchase or expand a farm or ranch, construct or improve an existing farm or ranch. And these also have a $300,000 loan limit, but this has a maximum 40 year term. Micro loans, which are pretty popular with our farmers can be used um, by anyone. And it has a $50,000 loan limit and a max 25 year term. Um, these can be used pretty much like the direct operating loans or the farm ownership loans, only they have a, a smaller loan limit and they can be used used to make capital improvement, um, soil water conservation, and for operational expenses. We also uh, provide guaranteed loans, um, which allows commercial aid lenders to extend credit to family farm operators and owners who do not qualify for standard commercial loans. Uh, these farmers receive credit at a reasonable term to finance their operation. And financial institutions receive additional loan business and servicing fees as well as up to 95% of protection from loss. Next. We also provide youth loans to young folks um, between the ages of 10 and 20 years old who participate in 4-H clubs, FFA, or a similar organization. Um, these loans have a $5,000 loan limit and a maximum seven-year term. Um, FSA supports the full participation of minority and women far family farmers in loan programs by targeting a portion of its direct and guaranteeing farm ownership and operating loans to this group. 
And we also uh, provide emergency loans. Uh, these can help farmers and ranchers recover from production and physical losses due to disasters such as drought, flooding, or hurricanes. Next. So this slide here um, describes how to get started with FSA. So if you want to come in, if you want to get started with FSA, you want to learn more about our programs, your first step is to contact your local FSA county office. Um, that link right there, if you click it, it'll show you a map of South Carolina and show you your closest FSA or your USDA service center. Um, FSA does not technically have an office in every county, but we do service every county in the state out of 36 offices throughout the state. Um, once you call, find out which USDA service center that you uh, should visit. Next, you need to bring your documents. That's gonna be your proof of identity, such as your driver's license, social security card. Um, you're gonna bring proof of your farm or ranch ownership, such as your deed, any leases, and any entity identification status documents, um, articles of incorporation, trust and estate documents, partnership agreements. Once you come in, you've got your documents, we're gonna to talk to you about what you wanna do on your farm, um, some of your needs, some of your goals and things that you would like to see in the future. And we're gonna assign you a farm tracking number. Your farm tracking number is really important. It's pretty much your gateway to participating with USDA and some of our programs, not only with FSA, but also with NRCS. Um, and once we determine that you're eligible for some of our programs, we'll go ahead on and help you to get signed up and apply. Next. So this slide is guidance for ears property operators who would like to participate in FSA programs. Um, the 2018 Farm Bill authorizes alternative documentation for ears properties operators to establish a farm number. I'm not sure if you all are uh, familiar with ears property, but usually um, just for a quick background, ears property is um, farmland a property that does not have a clear deed or title, but is usually owned by um, a group of family members. And so this, the Farm Bill from 2018 authorizes us to use alternative documentation um, rather than just a, a deed to work with these heirs property operators who are working a farm on heir property. So a farm number is required to be eligible for our programs, um, including lending, disaster programs, and participation in county committees. Operators on heirs property who cannot provide owner verification may provide alternative documents to substantiate that they are in general control of the farming operation. So what's the difference between a farm operator and a farm owner? A farm operator is defined by USDA as an individual entity or joint operation who is in general control of the farming operation for the current year, making the day-to-day -day management decisions. The operator could be an owner, a hired manager, cash tenant, shared tenant, or a partner. We define a farm owner as an individual entity who has legal ownership of that farmland. Next. Accepted items to establish a farm as an operator. So you could have a court order verifying the land meets the definition of heirs property as defined in the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. Um, you could have certification from the local recorder of deeds that the recorded owner of the land is deceased and at least one heir has initiated a procedure to retitle the land a Tennessee in common agreement approved by a majority of the owners that gives the individual the right to manage and control a portion or all of the land. Tax returns from the previous five years showing the individual has an undivided farming interest. Self-certification that the individual has control of the land for the purposes of operating a farm or ranch. And any other documentation accepted by the FSA County Office that establishes that the individual has general control of the farming operation, including but not limited to 
an affidavit from an owner stating that the individual has control of the land, limited power of attorney giving the individual control of the land, or canceled checks, receipts for rent payments, and or operating expenses. So my advice would be, if you are unsure of what is accepted, just contact your local USDA service center and have a chat with them. Next, I'm going to briefly talk about the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program 2, known as CFAP2. Um, this program actually rolled out last May of 2020, but there's been a great need for um, to help farmers through this pandemic. So we have rolled out this program several times, and this is our third time doing so. Um, USDA is providing this assistance to farmers and ranchers who have been impacted by COVID-19 market disruptions um, through the Pandemic Assistance for Producers Initiative. The application period for CFAP2 actually ended in December of 2020, but we reopened it on April 5th for at least 60 days. As of right now, we do not have a deadline for this program, it's just ongoing. So after this presentation, if you have questions or you see that you may qualify, please contact your USDA Service Center for more information because we are still accepting applications. Uh, eligible producers are producers of specified agricultural commodities who have faced continuing market disruptions and significant marketing, marketing costs due to COVID-19. To be eligible for payment, a person or legal entity must either have an average adjusted gross income of less than $900,000 for the tax years of 2016, 17, and 18, and derive at least 75% of their AGI from farming, ranching, or forested related activities. Next. Persons and legal entities also must commercially produce the eligible commodities, be in the business of farming at the time of application, uh, comply with the provisions of highly erodible land and wetland conservation regulations, often called the conservation compliance provisions. If a foreign person, they must provide land, capital, and a substantial amount of active personal labor to the farming operation and not have a controlled substance violation. Commodities grown under a contract in which the grower has ownership and production risk are also eligible for CFAP2. So CFAP2 will be split into three categories of commodities. These are price trigger commodities, flat rate crops, and sales commodities. For an entire list of eligible commodities, I mean, it's pretty extensive. Please visit farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. So where to file? So the easiest way to file is to visit your local USDA service center and work with one of our, our staff folks to get signed up. Um, CFAP has applications and forms available online at farmers.gov forward CFAP. But we also have a call center um, if you want to talk to someone directly. If you're not sure about your USDA service center or you just had a quick question, you can call that um, 877 number that's listed here, 877-508-8364 and speak directly with the USDA employee and they can help you. Um, if you have more questions, we do have a CFAP officially asked question page there on that last link. Um, farmers.gov forward slash CFAP1 forward slash FAQ. So if you have more questions, please uh, click that link, go there, and uh, take a look at some of the more common questions that we've received about the program. Next. I'm briefly going to just uh, talk about the American Rescue Plan Debt Forgiveness. Um, the ARP Act of 2021 provides debt relief to socially disadvantaged producers. Definition included in the ARP statute, outstanding direct or guaranteed farm loan, as well as farm storage facility loans with FSA. The 2501 definition of a socially disadvantaged farmer includes Black, African-American, American Indian or Alaskan Native, Hispanic or Latino, 
an Asian American or Pacific Islander. Gender is not a criteria in and of itself. And USDA is currently reviewing and working, working to implement this program. Um, more guidance will be coming forward for qualified buyers. We've actually um, gone ahead and pushed this program and we have sent out some letters to most of the producers who qualify. If you have questions about this program, I suggest you visit the link below, um, farmers.gov forward slash American Rescue Plan forward ARP dash FAQ. Um, it's several pages long and it has tons of common questions about this program and who's eligible. And if you have um, additional questions, I suggest you just give a quick call to your local USDA service center. Next. So this new program just rolled out last on the 22nd of July um, is pandemic assistance for timber harvester and haulers. A USDA is now providing up to $200 million to provide relief to timber harvesting and timber hauling businesses that have experienced losses due to COVID-19. Timber harvest, harvesting and hauling businesses that have experienced a revenue loss of at least 10% during the period of January 1st through December 1st of 2020 compared to the period of January 1st and December 1st of 2019 are encouraged to apply. Um, the application period will be open July 22nd through October 15th, 2021. To be eligible for payments, individuals or legal entities must be a timber harvesting or hauler hauling business where 50% or more of its gross in revenue is derived from more of the following. Cutting timber, transporting timber, or processing of wood on site on the forest land. Chipping, grinding, converting to biochar, cutting into smaller limbs. For more information on PATH, as this program is called, um, please visit our website, farmers.gov forward PATH or call 877-508-8364 and speak directly with a USDA employee. Next. So I'm gonna wrap up my presentation with a few frequently asked questions. Um, if you have additional questions after the meeting, I'll be here the whole time. Please feel free to ask, but I'm gonna just start with a few that I get often. Um, why should I register my farm with FSA? A farm number identifies and registers your land with the FSA office and makes your farm eligible to apply for USDA programs. You must have a farm number in order to apply for farm loans, disaster assistance, and crop insurance, as well as for NRCS programs like EQIP. Um, at this time, a farm number is not required to apply for CFAP2. Um, the farm number is associated with land and the history of production on the land is connected to the farm number and the land. So if you decide to sell the land and not continue to farm, that farm number and production history remain part of the value of the land. So that will help the next farmer, a producer who comes behind you. So that's why a farm number is so important. I wanna get an FSA loan to purchase a farm. Do I need any farm experience? FSA's direct farm ownership loans are used to buy a farm or ranch. This type of loan is different from all the other FSA loan offerings because Congress wrote into law an additional three-year experience requirement. These three years of experience must be within 10 years of the date of the loan application. Next. Can I get a special type of loan because I am a historically underserved farmer, beginning farmer, or veteran? Loans to historically underserved and women farmers and ranchers are not a special type of loan or program. Rather, this designation refers to a specific funding source known as Socially Disadvantaged Applicant, SDA. To be considered for targeted SDA loan funding, loan applicants must voluntarily voluntarily provide his or her ethnicity, race, and or gender on the loan application. Otherwise, these loans will be processed 
the loan process and the requirements are identical to our other loan, to all other loan applicants. What credit score is required to be approved for an FSA loan? FSA does not use credit scores. Loan applicants are expected to have acceptable repayment history with other creditors, including the federal government. Loan applicants are not automatically disqualified if there are isolated incidents of slow payments, no credit history, or if it can be shown that any recent credit problems are temporary and beyond the loan applicant's control. No history of credit transactions by a loan applicant does not automatically indicate an unacceptable credit history either. So that's the wrap up of my presentation. Again, I'm Sabrina Bryant, the State Outreach Coordinator. Um, here's my information, and I do believe that it was put into the chat box. If you have questions for me, feel free to call or email me after the meeting. If you would like more information about FSA and our programs, please go to the website below at the very end and sign up for Gov Delivery as we send out frequent updates about our programs and services. I thank you for your time and appreciate you listening in this morning. Brenton, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bryant. We once again appreciate the wonderful information that you just provided. Once again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to her. Um, as was mentioned, her contact information and all the other relevant information is on the screen. And once again, uh, everyone will receive this information at the conclusion of today's presentation. Next, we will have a, a presentation from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And this will be done by Stacy Henry, who is the Area Resource Conservationist. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for that introduction. My name is Stacy Henry. I am the Area Resource Conservationist for Area 1 in South Carolina and RCS. Next slide. Okay. NRCS provides technical and financial assistance to local farmers and producers. NRCS helps invest in your farm where the impact is felt in the local community. Our field offices will help you make informed decisions on which paths to take in our programs. We have tools, practices, and enhancements that are backed by scientific research to help improve your land and management. Next slide. NRCS has various programs available where Environmental Quality Incentive Program and Conservation Stewardship Program, known as CSP, are our most popular. NRCS invests an average of $8 million every day, $8 million every day into conservation systems that help producers stay profitable and productive. Next slide. Environmental Quality Incentive Program, known as EQIP. EQIP is a voluntary conservation program that helps farmers and owners of agriculture land, including forest landowners, improve their natural resources. And as you can see from the photos below, we cover several land uses. So you'll see forestry, grazing land, confined animal, operation, animal operations such as poultry and dairy, cropland, and wildlife habitat. Next slide. We have, a high, we have a seasonal high tunnel practice that's available through EQIP. It's easy to build, maintain, move, and they provide an energy efficient way to extend the growing season and improve plant health and vigor. Next slide. There's several things you need to know about high tunnel systems. The maximum area size restrictions have been removed. However, there is a $10,000 cost cap for this practice. To receive EQIP cost share assistance for irrigation under your high tunnel system, the land has to be irrigated two out of the past five years. This practice applies to existing cultivated cropland. Crops under your high tunnel system must be grown in the natural soil, no containers allowed. The system must be built from a pre-manufactured kit. Tunnel frames must be made of metal, wood, or durable plastic that must be at least six feet high. Next slide. Here are two photos of high tunnel systems. This high tunnel on the left shows no irrigation in the system that has been installed. 
The producer here is using a garden hose, garden hose and a sprinkler to help establish irrigation history, which is very important in cost share assistance with irrigation. The photo to the right, you can see that the side curtains are raised here to help with ventilation and also allow pollinators to enter the hive tunnel. As you know, pollinators help pollinate your plants that you may be growing in your hive tunnel system. Next slide. Equip irrigation financial assistance. Just in the previous pictures that you saw, you could see that um, we had one producer that was establishing his irrigation history his or her irrigation history. Here, irrigation assistance under the Environmental Quality Incentive Program is only available to producers that are converting existing systems to a more in efficient irrigation method and requires irrigation history two out of the last five years. So as you saw in the previous slide, the uh, producer was using a sprinkler that you could buy at your local Ace Hardware. And here, there's a more efficient irrigation system in place. Next slide. Livestock systems. NRCS call shares for livestock systems under the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Here you can see that we can call share for pasture planting, fencing, watering facilities, heavy use areas, pasture spraying, and livestock water wells. As you can see in the picture to the left, you have this little um, goat, it looks like, uh, drinking out of a watering facility, and he is standing on a heavy use area. Next slide. Longleaf pine. NRCS has a longleaf pine initiative that is cost shared through the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Um, previous years, that's fine, next slide, great. Um, Let's see, in previous years, there used to be 90 million acres of longleaf pine habitat in the southeast, and now we only have 4 million acres of longleaf pine habitat. This initiative is helping to reestablish these ecosystems in priority areas. As you can see from this map, the lower part of the state is in the priority area, and this is due to soil types. As you can see, the northern part of the state does not qualify for the longleaf pine initiative due to soil types. Next slide. In this longleaf pine initiative, NRCS can cost share for conservation cover that is planted to help wildlife with um, food source and cover. We also help cost share to prescribe burn tree shrub establishment where we plant the pines, and forest stand improvement where we may do some understory control and thinning. Next slide. This is another popular program that NRCS provides. The program is called Conservation Stewardship Program, also known as CSP. The Conservation Stewardship Program encourages agricultural and forestry producers to maintain existing conservation activities and adopt additional ones on their operations. Next slide. You have to meet eligibility criteria in this program. So you must be able to meet two priority resource concerns at the time of application, plus one additional resource concern at the end of the contract. And you must enroll all eligible land in your entire agricultural or forestry operation as listed with Farm Service Agency. Next slide. CSP pays participants for conservation performance. The higher the performance, the higher the payment. These contracts are usually built on five years with the option to renew at the end of the five-year period. The minimum payment per year is $1,500 per year. You also have payment limitations within this program where an individual can only receive $40,000 per year and entities can receive $80,000 per year. Next slide. Other things that we can do with the Conservation Stewardship Program is to exclude livestock from to have access from streams, ditches, and other water bodies to reduce nutrients and pathogens in surface water and we do this by installing fences. 
Another thing that we can do is we can improve grazing with the introduction of native grasses or legumes in your forage base. Next slide. Here, the picture on the left is a picture of where a producer is growing cover crops in a no-till system to reduce soil erosion and increase soil health and soil organic matter. On the right, you can see that we are enhancing, have an enhanced field border here to reduce erosion or provide wildlife food and cover. Next slide. We can also establish pollinator habitat as food borders for food and shelter. And on the right, you can see that we can establish monarch butterfly habitat that includes a species such as milkweed shown above. Next slide. CSP also works on forestry land. Here we can create patch openings to enhance wildlife food, cover and shelter. And here we can also reduce forest stand density to improve degraded plant community or improve wildlife food sources. And as you can see, the word enhance is used repetitively here. So here on the right, we're reducing the forest stand density because we're enhancing the degraded plant community and making it better, or we're trying to improve the wildlife food sources. Next slide. There are many different ways you have to become eligible to be part of the NRCS programs. We have producer eligibility and we have land eligibility. So first, let's talk about producer eligibility requirements. You must be an individual or legal entity. You must have signature authority for a legal entity. You must be the owner or actively engaged in the management of the agricultural or forestry operation being enrolled. This is documented by either of the following. Records from Farm Service Agency to identify owner or operator, or production of $1,000 in ag products produced, sold, or both, woodland owners are exempt from this requirement. Next slide. You must have control of the land. You must also be in compliance with the provisions for protecting the interests of tenants and sharecroppers. You must be in compliance with highly erodible land and wetland provisions. And you also must be within the Farm Bill payment limitation of $450,000 from the period of fiscal year 2019 through fiscal year 2023. Next slide. You must also meet the average adjusted gross income requirements of $900,000 and you must meet special emphasis applicant criteria if applying for those criteria and you self-certify to receive the 90% payment rate. Those uh, categories are new beginning farmer, limited resource producer, socially disadvantaged farmer, or veteran farmer. And you also must meet the requirements for the organic initiative if that's ap applicable to the program that you're applying for. Next slide. As I said before, there's individual eligibility and land eligibility. So now we're gonna talk about land eligibility. You must be, it must be agriculture land. You must be, you must privately own the land or have documented have a documented deed or lease on file. You must have permission of the landowner to install any structural practices if your land is leased. You must also have identified resource concerns. And you must also have irrigation history two out of the past five years if you're applying for irrigation. Next slide. Participants meeting one of the four categories of special emphasis applicants are eligible for the 90% cost share payment rate. Those individuals are new and beginning farmer, where they must meet both of these following criteria, not operated for more than 10 consecutive years, and must provide the day-to-day -day operations and labor. Next slide. Socially disadvantaged includes all minority participants, as previously mentioned. And number three, limited resource farmers, must meet both of these criteria, gross farm sales of not more than the current index value of each of the two previous years, total household income at or below the national poverty level for the family of four, 
And for more information, you can um, go to this website below or type in limited resource farmer NRCS and it should take you to the appropriate site. Next slide. For a veteran farmer, this is a farmer who has served in the armed forces and has operated a farm no more than 10 years. So they must also meet the new and beginning farmer criteria or who first obtained veteran status during their most recent 10, period, 10 year period. Veteran farmers must meet the new and beginning farmer criteria. Next slide. What are these steps to obtaining this financial assistance through NRCS? NRCS has many offices in different counties. Now, every county has an office like Farm Service Agency had mentioned their offices, but we do have contacts for you that we are putting in the chat. Visit your local NRCS office and discuss your goals with the staff in the office. Fill out an application. There should be applications available to you through the chat box below. Um, fill out an application. Uh, determine who your DC is for your specific county. Meet up with them, take them your application. We will do eligibility and we work with Farm Service Agency determine your, to determine your eligibility. Once you're eligible, NRCS ranks applications according to local resource concerns. And we put conservation to work by signing a contract and implementing conservation practices and or enhancements. Next slide. Another way to find out who your local NRCS district conservation district conservationist is is visiting www.sc.nrcs.usda.gov. And we will also put this website down in the chat as well. Next slide. When you go to that website, you'll click on Contact Us and click on Newberry if you're in the upstate or Clarendon if you're in the lower part of the state. These two links will actually bring up others other counties that are in your area. And here you can see that we have two area contacts. Next slide. Thank you so much for your attention today. And I want to really encourage you to visit your local field office. I also want to encourage you to fill out these applications. It's okay to fill out the application to determine to see if you really want to go through the whole process. Filling out the application puts you in the office and in the system. You can always say no if the program just turns out to be not for you. You can say no, I've decided otherwise, anytime through the process. But it's always good to go in and, and apply so that you can see if you are available for funding and if it would help you. And you know, these field offices, they end up making this a family affair. We work with you and your family who also operates the land. So pass on the knowledge that you've learned today and encourage others to contact NRCS. And thank you so much and I'll be glad to stick around and answer any questions you may have. Mr. Brown, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ms. Henry, for that wonderful uh, presentation about the programs and the information uh, that is available to our participants from the NRCS. Next, we will have a presentation by the Risk Management Agency, and this presentation will be uh, led by Ms. Davina Lee, who is the Director of the Valdosta Regional Office. So without any further ado, Ms. Lee, please thank you for your presentation. Um, good morning, and thank you, um, Brent, for the introduction. And thank you all for the opportunity to present information regarding the Risk Management Agency. Um, as Brent mentioned, my name is Davina Lee. I am the director in the Valdosta Regional Office. My office handles the crop insurance program in, um, on a regional basis, which includes South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, um, Alabama, and then the island of Puerto Rico. Next slide, please. The, the Risk Management Agency, we administer the federal crop insurance program. It's important for crop insurance for our producers because it provides a means to mitigate some of the production and revenue losses that farmers have to endure. 
It's also important because it provides a, a safety net for our ag producers. Oftentimes, um, lending institutions will not allow farmers to borrow money unless they have some type of crop insurance that they purchased, whether it's through FSA or RMA. And then finally, it's important because um, it helps to maintain a durable economy. Um, this will allow in times of uh, disasters or production loss on the farm or revenue loss on the farm for the farmer to be able to receive some revenue or indemnity payment um, to help cover the loss for that crop year or to help prepare for the upcoming crop year. Next slide, please. The Risk Management Agency, um, we have a um, public-private partnership with our insurance providers. We are a regulatory agency. We don't actually sell or service our, our programs or policies. We work with, or we have contracts with approved insurance providers to sell and service them for us. We develop all the products and then they will sell it for us. And they in turn have contracts with agents who actually are your first line um, contact whenever you um, are purchasing a policy. Next slide, please. So what does RMA do? We are responsible for creating all of the policies and procedures to it uh, for the different crop programs um, that we have available. We establish all of the rates, um, we develop the county yields, as well as any prices that are associated with the commodity. On the A, the administrative and operating side, we are working with the producers to validate any premium or loss information that's um, provided to us by them. Um, we determine whatever underwriting gains or losses are, and then we settle or provide payment to the insurance providers for selling and servicing our products. We're also involved in creating new programs. We're also, we're always wanting to find out if our programs and policies can be improved or if there are other um, niches out there that needs to be insured. And so we're working with the industry to create new products or expand the current existing programs that we, ha we, we currently have. Next slide, please. So producers, your contracts are with your agent or your insurance company. As I mentioned before, it's a public-private partnership. So we um, don't have direct interaction most of the time with producers. Their main frontline con uh, contact is with the, their agent or their insurance company. So with your, your obligation would be when you have your crop insurance agent is to make sure you report your acreage timely and accurately, meet all of the deadlines that are established in your policy, pay the premiums when they're due and to report any losses immediately to your agent so that a loss adjuster can come out and take a look at um, your crop so that you can get paid timely. Next slide. In return, your agent or your insurance company should be able to provide you accurate answers to any questions that you may have regarding your coverage. Um, they're supposed to be processing promptly your policy as well as making any type of payment that you're owed in a timely manner for losses that are covered under your policy. Next slide. So the Risk Management Agency, we insure several different um, types of programs. We have the, um, we have protection against production loss as well as revenue losses um, due to price decline or um, production loss or both, for both. Um, we insure um, we have APH programs as well as any type of revenue programs such as our whole farm. And then we also have area risk programs, which are uh, programs that's based on an area or a county. Okay, next slide, please. Here is a list of commodities that we currently have policies for. Um, all of these programs are not in all counties, but if there are anywhere in um, the region or the, the country, there is a possibility that coverage can still be obtained through what we call a written agreement process, which I'll go over a little bit later. Um, we insure everything from your traditional row crops, such as corn, cotton, peanuts, 
We do vegetable crops. We have policies for vegetables such as um, peppers, tomatoes. We even have uh, special um, um, specialty crops such as um, what we're considering um, hemp and strawberries. Those currently are pilot programs and are not insurable right now by written agreement. But anything that is a permanent program or regulatory program, we can insure if it's not in your county by a written agreement. Only when it's a pilot program that we cannot insure. So currently we only have hemp in Alabama. I know that's been a popular crop and we've had several questions about if hemp is gonna be offered in South Carolina. Um, a lot of that depends on what is being reported to FSA. Um, so if you are growing hemp and you're interested in insuring it uh, through crop insurance, RMA program, it's important that those acres are reported to FSA so that we can get that information to our developers and hopefully in the future be able to insure it in South Carolina. So this is just a glimpse of what's insurable in my, in, in our, my region. There are several programs that are offered in other parts of the country. Um, again, if you're growing a specialty crop and we have a policy for it, it is a possibility that they can still be insured by a written agreement. Okay, next, next slide, please. Most of our uh, policies cover production losses or revenue losses due to adverse weather, such as uh, hurricanes, frost, freeze, frost, drought, freeze, um, any type of catastrophic weather events, um, failure of irrigation, water supply, fire, insect and disease, provided that proper control measures are in place as well as wildlife and price fluctuations. Next slide, please. This slide is just to show for South Carolina only what are the top 10 commodities based on liability or value of the crop that we're insuring in the state. Corn is the highest liability right now with $147.8 million in liability. This is as of June 16th, and this was for crop year 2020. Next slide. For the past three years in South Carolina, this has been the experience. We've on average insured at least 1.1 million acres or more. Um, we've paid out quite a bit of in, uh, indemnities in the state of South Carolina. Um, a lot of it has been due to excess moisture. Hurricane Issa is received quite a bit of payment last year, as well as there was some freeze damage on some of the crops. So this is what we've paid out for the last three years in South Carolina in indemnities. And this is as of June 16th. Next slide, please. We offer several levels of coverage for crop insurance. Our most basic and lowest level of coverage is the catast catastrophic insurance, which we refer to as cat insurance. It is a minimum level of coverage with 50% um, coverage for the yield and 55% of the price election, which generally just means um, for cat coverage, you'll lose, you, you would only get paid up to 50% of the damage that was lost or incurred. Um, there is no premium that is owed on the cat. It's 100% subsidized. There is an administrative fee of $655 per crop per county. Um, and um, it's very similar to the FSA's NAP program. Okay, next slide. The, another level of coverage that we offer is our buy-up, and you can buy up um, anything from 50 to most, most policies is at least 75%, but we do have policies that where we go up to at least 85%, and we do cover or offer coverage of up to 100% of the price election for the buy-up policies. Producer premium is subsidized, meaning the producer pays a portion and the government pays another portion, uh, the, another part of the premium based on the level of coverage that you select. There is also an administrative fee of $30 per crop per county. Okay, next slide. Um, when I mentioned about um, subsidy, uh, subsidized, government pays a portion, producer pays a portion, here are our subsidy factors for our programs. Again, it's based on your level of coverage. Um, depending on what you pick, um, it will show you how much the government would pay and then what your premium share would be. The lower level of coverage you have, 
the more the government pays and the higher the level of coverage, um, the, the premium subsidy the government pays goes down. So as an example, if your premium was, uh, if your total premium cost was um, $100 and you pick, purchased a policy at the 65% coverage level, the government would pay $59 of that 100 and then you would be responsible for the $41 remaining balance. Next slide. This is uh, just an example of how um, the policy would pay out. The example is for Lee County, South Carolina. Producer had 6% coverage level. Um, his APH is 1,100 pounds per acre. Um, this is the projected price for crop year 2020 was 80, 80 cents, and then the harvest price was 86, 86 cents. So during this calculation, with the pounds per acre and the coverage level of 60 cents, the pounds per acre insurer, the guarantee would come out to be $660. With the price election or projected price of 80 cent, the amount of insurance or the liability would be $528. In this example, the producer only produced 350 pounds instead of the 660, so it's way be it's below the guarantee. Producer would end up, after all the calculations, being receiving an indemnity in the amount of $248. The producer premium minus any um, uh, the, the premium the producer would owe, the por portion that he would pay would be $31.56 on this, in this example, with a total net value of $496. And you see the calculations there, the indemnity, plus the, the amount that the, produce, the crop produced minus any premium paid. And that's for a yield protection example. The next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about whole farm revenue. I've already mentioned to you about individual policies that we insure on previous slide, everything from your traditional row crops. Um, those policies are individual policies. The whole farm revenue is kind of what we consider an umbrella policy. Next slide, please. That will allow you to insure um, your crops, all of your crops under one policy. Um, it is, um, it covers from 50 to 85 percent, we offer between 50 and 85 percent coverage level. The more commodities you have to ensure, the greater the amount of um, discounts you receive. Uh, let's see. Um, um, the increased commodity diversity reduces the cost. Um, also, if you have or you purchase uh, individual policy as well as a whole farm policy, that also reduces your cost. For example, if you were wanted to insure your cotton under a cotton policy, but you also wanted to have a, a whole farm policy that you want to insure cotton, um, greens, or um, um, I guess the sweet potatoes, you want to include all of that under this whole farm, you'll get a discount because you are also insuring your cotton under the individual policy. Cat coverage is not available for whole farm, but you can have um, NAP insurance as well as whole farm on the same, uh, for the same crops. Next slide, please. So what is whole farm? It provides a guarantee based on your historical revenue. Again, it's, it's very ideal for those producers that ha are diversified or have specialty or organic commodities that you're growing. Um, it all can be covered under this policy. Um, whole Farm offers protection for many commodities not currently offered by RMA or not available that's in your state or county. For example, if you wanted, if you grew strawberries and you wanted to insure those, you can do so under the Whole Farm policy as well as um, a whole um, a whole variety of, of different commodities that that may be um, available in your county. And we'll go a little bit more over that later. Next slide, please. So um, we have a tool that's available and I'll show you how to get there um, towards the, the end of my presentation. But to see what whole farm commodities are available, I um, have a little, um, um, the example should have shown what's available in Lee County, but um, I'm seeing, I see that I have Georgia still on here. You have to forgive me for that. But when you go into what we call our actual information browser, you can go to your county and um, pull up your whole farm and see what commodities are covered under whole farm. So for um, 
this county here in Peach County, Georgia, you can see on the whole farm, we're covering um, several different commodities such as apples, um, barley, we have broccoli, cabbage. Um, if you wanna know what's available, uh, what's included in your um, county, you would go here. Um, I think if you hit the, hit the slide, it'll pop up. Yeah, so if there's something that you're growing that's not listed on the commodity tab, uh, you would just contact our office and we'll work to get it added for the following year. Okay, next slide. What do you need to qualify for Whole Farm? The sales closing date, um, if you are a calendar year filer, is February 28th. Um, you need to have at least five years of your tax records from your farming identity, uh, for, for your farming entity. If you qualify as a beginning farmer or, or a veteran farmer and rancher, you will only need three years. It must be the most recent um, five years or three years of Schedule Fs. You'll need to be able to provide a list of commodities that you plan to produce, as well as the expected yield and revenue for each of those commodities. And um, get with an agent and they'll be able to help you um, come up with, uh, help you through the process and, and help you with the policy. Okay, next slide. What well, causes a loss under Whole Farm? Um, because it's uh, tax-based, um, you have to have filed your taxes for the year before a claim can be paid. However, as soon as you notice a loss, you must make sure you let your insurance company know so a loss adjuster can come out and take a look and also document what your losses are. Um, we provide coverage when revenue for those crops that you have insured is less than your insured revenue. Um, that's due to natural causes like our other programs or decline in market price during the insurance period. Okay, next slide. As far as subsidy goes for a whole farm, as I mentioned, the more commodities you have, the more, um, the more you'll be able to receive a subsidy discount. Uh, for if you have one, the subsidy assistance, sorry y'all, the subsidy, um, assistance for one commodity is 67% at the 50% coverage level, whereas if you have three or more commodities, you'll receive 80% subsidy um, discount. So the more diverse you are, the more that you cover, the more subsidy assistance you will receive. Next slide. Um, the last portion I'm gonna talk about is uh, written agreements. This portion is basically if there is a program that you're growing in your county and we don't currently have a, a policy or program there, um, you can ensure, you can work with an agent to submit uh, a, a request for a written agreement. Um, we have forms and your agent should be able to help you with that, to complete that. Um, to receive a, a written agreement, you must have produced the crop in the county or area for at least three years. Uh, your request must be signed and submitted on or before the sales closing date or the cancellation date for your crop. And um, we, our office, once we receive the paperwork, your production history, as well as your um, request, uh, change, your request for change form, we will evaluate to see if our written agreement will be, if you will be eligible to receive a written agreement. Next slide. Okay. This basically just kind of kind of says the same thing. Um, the required documents must be in our RO in our regional office no later than 15, 15 days after the sales closing date uh, for us to be able to evaluate and make an offer. Okay, next slide. Um, beginning farmer rancher or veteran farmer rancher benefits. We do have um, programs where this. Um, where we allow these benefits to um, for our producers. If applied for and granted, it will last up to five years. Um, there is an exemption of the administrative fee for catastrophic as well as our buyout policies. As you remember, the administrative fee for CAT was $655 and for buy-up it was $30 administrative fee. If you qualify as a beginning farmer or rancher, veteran farmer or rancher, those fees will be waived. Um, you'll also receive an additional 10% percentage points on the premium subsidy 
So back before, um, if you qualified or if you purchased um, a 65% coverage level, um, government would pay $59 off of that $100. Well, with the BFR or BFR, it would go up to $69 and then you would be paying remaining part. So that's 10 more, 10 more dollars or 10% point, percentage points that you would pay, uh, the government would pay if you qualify. You also are able to use uh, production history from any farming operation. If you were um, previously involved in working on a particular farm and if the producer will allow you, you can use his uh, production history to help get yours established if you're a beginning farmer or rancher. Okay, um, next slide. Um, if you hit the um, next slide, a couple more here yeah, again and again. This is um, just wanted to show you some useful tools that you can find if you hit it one more time. I think that'd be the last one. There are several tools that you can come um, go on our website. Our website is rma.usda.gov. And if you go to the tools option as um, demonstrated here, you'll see um, where I was talking about the actual information browser, where you'll be able to go and define, determine what crops are available in your state or in your county. Um, you'll be able to pull up information such as um, the dates um, that, that, that are applicable to the crop, as well as the rates and yields and the prices. That's all found under the actual information browser. Um, there's also a tool, I think if you hit it one more time, there's a cost estimator tool that, that you can put in your variable, your, your farm inputs like your acres, your uh, production, um, and then it'll help you come up with how much crop insurance will cost you, as well as if there were a loss, what you would be paid. That's found under the cost estimator. And then finally, um, there's a link here that if you are interested in crop insurance, but don't know uh, of an agent or insurance company, you can go to the agent locator, um, enter your state and county, and it'll show you those agents that are selling crop insurance in your area. Okay, next slide. And again, that's, that's it for me. My name is Davina Lee, and I'll be glad to stick around and answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Brent, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you again, Ms. Lee, for the wonderful information that you provided um, to our attendees today about the resources with the Risk Management Agency. Uh, once again, we would like to uh, thank our presenters, Ms. Sabrina Bryant, who is with the Farm Service Agency, Ms. Stacy Henry, who is with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Ms. Davina Lee, who is with the Risk Management Agency. Um, at this particular point in time, we will have our question and answer segment. Um, let me stop sharing the screen so that we can uh, be sure that we uh, answer any questions that attendees may have. Once again, this session is being recorded. Um, so you'll have access not only to the contact information for all of our presenters, um, but you also have access to the information that was presented as well. So if we are not able to cover all of the questions that you have on today, please feel free to reach out um, if you need some more resources at your disposal. Um, but we will now go and look at the chat function to see if there are any questions that anyone may have, or if there are any questions that will be taken live from those who are in attendance. So searching through the chat, um, I see that there is one question um, from one attendee. Um, if any of our presenters would like to talk about if there's any funding that's available for hemp farmers, um, if you would like to speak about any funding um, or resources available for those who are hemp farmers. Hi, hi, Brenton. I did answer um, that question as far as FSA. I do believe there are loans available uh, for hemp producers. I suggest that if you're interested in, in receiving a loan uh, to check with your local FSA law office and talk to a loan manager about that. Thank you very much. NRCS can also assist with conservation on hemp farms as well. Okay, thank you very much. I see looking at the chat function that 
Uh, there's a Ms. Benita Clemens who has a question. Uh, Ms. Clemens, if you would please unmute and ask your question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand. Okay, no, no problem at all. No problem. Yes, ma'am, no problem. Yeah, I have some other uh, colleagues. I'm with the South Carolina Black Farmers Coalition, and a few of us are on here. Um, if any of them would like to have a question, uh, ask a question, could y'all y'all can also raise your hand for me? Yes. Yeah, so, there are any members who who have questions? Um, please feel free to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I see that we have a very bevel whose hand is raised. So uh, if you will please ask your question. Yes, um, as far as as far as for um, um, timber haulers, the truckers. Um, is this I, I just read um, there was there was an assistant for the path program for us. Yes, there is. Um, that program just rolled out on July 22nd. So I think it came out last Thursday. So it's relatively new and it does provide um, assistance for truck, for I guess truck haulers and harvesters who have, or timber harvesters and haulers who have been negatively affected by the pandemic. Um, if you're interested in it, I suggest also contacting your local service center and um, having a chat with them about it. And, and seeing if you qualify. It's gonna be open until October 15th. October 15th? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bevel. Are there any other questions from, uh, from those? Um, looking to see if there are any more hands that are raised. I don't see any hands, any hands raised from attendees. If there is anyone who is joining us by phone, once again, um, if you will press star six and you will be able to unmute yourself on the phone and you can ask any questions that you may have of our presenters. I see that there's a Derek Hopkins with his hand raised. So uh, if you will please unmute and ask your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, are there programs or individuals who can help uh, farmers uh, and ranchers through some of these processes? I, I've heard of the technical assistance, um, but let's say, uh, for instance, I have a farm now, uh, the total track is 88 acres, but I want to um, create a timber program there. We, we cut the timber uh, a few years ago, but I wanna, we wanna add a, timber program. We ha also have some conservation practices that we want to renew. Um, uh, my grandfather and my mother, uh, they create the originals, but uh, I, I'm not totally familiar with all of the steps. We have the farm number uh, we and we have some historical paperwork, but uh, I, I don't get much help with that in my local office. And I've spoken on this several times throughout uh, uh, several webinars, but um, getting that type of technical assistance is very difficult in Hampton County. I'll go back on mute if somebody wants to ask the question. Is there someone who can walk us through or help us create these paper trails and plug us into these programs? Mr. Hopkins, as far as NRCS, you should be able to walk into the field office and sign an application and speak to the district conservationist there or the staff there. Um, the first thing they should be helping you do is fill out the application. And then they should also be uh, kind of walking you through what to do next for eligibility. And at that point, you would work with NRCS and FSA together to help uh, complete your eligibility requirements. Okay, I, again, I've tried that a couple of different times. I don't get much guidance here, except some paperwork printed off the web of information I already have. 
and uh, hand it to me. Mr. Hopkins, could you um, contact me personally after this meeting and I'll assist you? Yes, ma'am. What is your name again? I'm sorry. My name is Stacy Henry. Thank you. I did get your information out of the chat. I will. So. Yeah, give me a call. I'll be glad to help you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, attendees who, who have a question? Please feel free to either raise your hand or to unmute yourself and ask your question. Once again, if you are on a phone, um, to unmute yourself, if you'll just please press star six. As we're just waiting a few more moments to see if anyone has any questions, uh, if you look, look in the chat box, um, I just placed in there um, information about a survey uh, to help us better uh, plan for future events. Um, so if you will, um, you know, please take a few moments to complete this survey. Um, it'll give us a better understanding of how we can move forward, how, how we can assist you. Um, and once again, that link has been placed in the chat box for you. Okay, looking, I'm looking in the chat box and it seems that we have a Mr. Ronald Friday who has a question. You will please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, sir, on Monday, there was an email came out saying the USDA announced pandemic assistance for timber haulers. And also there was another talk that says that about producer with crop insurance will receive a premium benefit for cover crops. But in that email, it did not provide the attachment, never talked about it. It only attaches, it attached the pandemic for timber parishes and haulers only. Uh, I don't know if Ms. Lee can answer this question or is this something that was a mistake from Farmers Gov that came out? Because I looked for what was it talking about for crop insurance, the, the benefit, but there's nothing in these. I got two emails, but neither one of them provided about the crop, crop insurance. Let me find that email. Uh, we did have a program available, um, but uh, producers had to have notified or completed their cover crops by June. I think it was June 15th in order to be eligible for the um, cover crop program, but it may be something else that I'm missing. So let me do some research, Mr. Friday, and, and, I'll, and, and I'll get back with you. Or if you want to give me a call, you, I know you, uh, you can do that as well. Good, good. Nice seeing you, Miss Lee. Thank you. All right. I'll, I'll call you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you again. Um, once again, before we conclude, I want to give just a few more moments to see if there are any others who have any questions. Uh, once again, um, if you think of something at a later date, please do not hesitate to reach out to our presenters so that they can assist you. Um, but once again, if you are on the phone, uh, to unmute yourself, please press star six. Um, or if you're joining us via Zoom, please use the raise hand function so that I could recognize you to answer any questions that you may have before we conclude today's presentation. Okay, seeing no further questions, um, and seeing no indications of further questions. Once again, I would like to uh, thank not, just, not only the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, but also the representatives for today, once again, uh, from the Farm Services Agency. Uh, Farm Service Agency, we had Ms. Sabrina Bryant from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We had Ms. Stacy Henry. And then from the Risk Management Agency, we had Ms. Davina Lee, um, who all gave wonderful information um, that can assist minority farmers here in the state of South Carolina. Once again, this meeting was recorded and everyone who is on the meeting will receive an update that will have the recording and also access to the presentation as well. Um, once again, there was a link that was placed in the chat box for a survey function. If you could please take a few moments at the conclusion of the presentation uh, to fill out that survey so we can know how we can best serve you. Um, and you can also uh, 
can check out the Commission for Minority Affairs. Uh, we will do regular updates on social media and on our website regarding future um, presentations along these lines and other presentations for the good of the community. And you're also uh, welcome as well to reach out to the USDA um, and their tenant agencies to look at the information that is going to be beneficial to you as well. Uh, on behalf of our Board of Commissioners at the Commission for Minority Affairs and our Executive Director, Dr. Dolores DaCosta, and once again, uh, a great thank you to all the members of the U.S. Department of Agriculture for their wonderful information. Um, I want to thank you uh, as attendees for coming out on today to receive this wonderful information. We ask that not only do you take this information for yourself, but please share it with others who were not able to join us on today. Um, once again, we appreciate your participation. Please stay safe and have a great day.